Richard Landis is an historian and author who specializes in medieval millennial thinking. His interests include media manipulation intended to defame, demonize, and delegitimize the Jewish state. He's just published a new book, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? Lethal Journalism, Anti-Semitism, and Global Jihad. He's dropped by FDD World Headquarters to talk about that himself and maybe a little about what people were thinking around the year 1000. Thanks for being with us, too, here on Foreign Policy. So thanks for coming in again, Professor Landis. Thank you for having me. Start by talking about yourself and what inspired or or maybe drove you uh, to write this book, which I believe you've been working on for like like a decade. Yeah. <laughs> Alas. Um, my wife still remembers my saying, oh, I'll just take some of my blog posts and turn it into a book. It won't take me long. Easy to do, I know, right. yeah. And then it ended up being a history of uh, my own time, basically from the year 2000 onward, which is the point at which, for a variety of reasons, some of them empirical and some of them conceptually driven by my work on millennialism, I see as a real turning point in the West. Not that these ideas and and currents that I chronicle in the book didn't exist before. In some cases, like in Middle Eastern studies, they were very strong. But in the year 2000, in a, in a sense, there's a great book by Robert Piercig on uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle I remember very yeah. well reading. Did so, you ever read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Uh, I don't know how it hold up. I, I remember thinking right, it was great when right. I read I it I have it on ago. Kindle. So um, at one point, he has this insight into the difference between quantitative and qualitative. And he describes it in terms of a seed crystal and how you can get a super saturated solution that's still liquid. And then a seed crystal comes and it seizes. And that's what I'm arguing happened in 2000, that a certain attitude, which I'm calling in the book Y2K Mind, seized in the year 2000. And Y2K Mind is essentially summed up in the following sentence. When jihadis attack a democracy, blame the democracy. And this may be entirely wrong, but is there either a parallel or is this part of it that political correctness, you know, the right way and the sensitive way to talk, suddenly crystallized as a full woke ideology. I would even say a dogma. A dog- it, yeah. It yeah, a dogma. You're right. All of a sudden, for example, up until the Oslo peace process in 1993, there were people who argued that the Palestinians were a creation of Soviet uh, propaganda and of Yasser Arafat, and that there was no real Palestinian identity. And then, all of a sudden, with the Oslo peace process, there was a group of people saying, no, there are people, they deserve a state, we need to make peace with them. And this became what had previously been considered literally unsayable in Israel, because by and large, these people were dedicated to the destruction of the state, all of a sudden became an option. But in 2000, precisely when the Palestinian leadership showed what it was about by declaring what I call the Oslo Jihad, what they call the Al-Aqsa Antifada, um, all of a sudden it became racist to even suggest that the Palestinians were not serious about peace, that the Palestinians were not a people, that the Palestinians didn't deserve a state. All of a sudden that became way right wing. It was like a major shift in the Overton yeah. window. Yeah. Here's my conception. You tell me if you think I'm wrong. I think that in 1948, you you couldn't say there was a Palestinian people. In 1966, you couldn't say there was a Palestinian people. That in a way, Yasser Arafat was the father of the Palestinian people. So it's, it's, it's it started with him saying, we Palestinian Arabs even though we're from all over the, 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 the Ottoman Empire and some of us came here because the Jews were providing economic opportunity, we are now a people. But then there was the need to say, and we have a long history. And the people, and I've had people insist there was a Palestinian, there's a country called Palestine. No, there wasn't. There were, there were empires there. 
Uh, going back to the 7th century, the Arabs conquered it, and the Ottoman Empire had it for hundreds of years, and the British for a short time. And so this idea that there was this ancient Palestinian nation that came out of Canaan, as opposed to the Arabs conquered in the 7th century, this whole area and much of the civilized and uncivilized world in the 7th century, and the Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years, from based in what we now call Turkey, um, they controlled this area of the world. It was kind of a backwater with Syria. And then the British defeated well, the Allies and the British took over after the defeat of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of modern Turkey. And then, of course, the, 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 the when the British left, the, the Jews said, well, we'd like to have our own state. And the UN said, well, how about an Arab state and a Jewish state, not a right, Palestinian? Right. Because in those days, this is, remember, right. if you said, oh, he's a Palestinian, you probably were referring Man, to a Jew, Jew right. not an Arab. The Palestinian right. Post, now the Jerusalem Post, the Jewish right. paper, Palestinian Symphony. Oh, I just want, people don't know this, and I want to right. re re remind right. people of this. So, I, I mean, I agree there's a Palestinian people now, although— you got to figure people living in Gaza are significantly different different from people living in the West Bank. And if you're an Israeli Arab and an, who right. maybe identify as a Palestinian, many that's do not. Many, right. many do, many don't. Don't. However, uh, various ways. Um, you know, our our mutual friend, the great journalist Khaled Abu Tome, right. will say, "Hey, I am an Arab. I'm a Palestinian. I'm an Israeli. I'm a Muslim. I'm all these things. What's the problem?" And that's the difference. So it's anyhow. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> digress but i often uh, right. i often do mm -hmm. so you're saying that you saw you see a specific time when there were these this new approach and you had to say this is how it's always been that didn't develop this way we're not changing our mind we're not no 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 it's always been and worse if you don't agree with me you're a racist and you're, right. and you're inhumane and yeah and race is such a funny word because which you know who are the races here there is a, there's not a Muslim race, surely. The Jews were certainly considered a race by Hitler, but the race in those days were, it was a very different, uh, the, the concept of race is very fluid and very, and very sketchy. Uh, you, you and I both know who Bernard Lewis was, and, and he, you know, he tells the story of when he was in Britain and he was joining the military. And the recruiting sergeant said, eh, Mr. Lewis, what race are you? And he said, oh, my God. And you know, it was World War II. And he said, oh, this is, I don't know what to say. And he kind of fumbled. He said, well, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. He said, this is not a hard question, Mr. Lewis. What race are you? Are you English? Are you Scottish? Are you Welsh or are you Irish? <laughs> he said, oh, that's right. Uh, that was, a, I'm, he said, right. I, I'm English. He said, all right, well, you're English. And that's, <laughs> uh, that was the concept of race back then. People don't, right. don't, don't get that now. It's, anyhow. Um, by the way, one more thing I want to talk about you. Yeah, be, I hope you will mind. You're, right. Because I knew of your father long before I ever met you, and right. your father was a very was a late great Harvard professor of economics, right. David Landis, author of The Wealth and Poverty of Nations: Why Some Are So Rich and Some So Poor. And I read that years ago. And if I had to describe it briefly, I would say he was politically correct before there was political politically correctness, incorrect. because he was saying, and tell me if I'm wrong, that in the boil down the thesis was that whether a country becomes rich or poor has less to do with resources than with culture, values, exactly. work ethic, another phrase you're not right. allowed to talk about nowadays, right. but it exists. That's right. what he, and he was criticized for, even then for being Eurocentrist. Absolutely. But then, and by the way, he's been praised by people like Neil Ferguson, who I think is one of the great living historians right now and does a podcast with uh, H.R. McMaster, who chairs our military center. Um, anyhow, now, one of the things you write in your book that, that goes along this line, but say anything you want to about your father and all that, you write that your medieval history professor at Princeton, right, Patrick Geary, began his lecture on Europe in the 11th century with the following paradox. I love this. If one looks at the world in the year 1000, the most successful civilizations, the first world of the day was Song China and Abbasid Arabia, the European West would be down at the bottom of the third world, vulnerable to waves of raiders invading from all sides, exporters of primary goods, including human beings. That's where the word slave comes from. Slav. It's Slav. Right. People don't know. Slav and slave. That's a, they're, and right. And white slaves from Europe bring brought into the Muslim world. And so the, the ubiquity of slavery as institution, as opposed to, for example, what my alma mater has, you know, has put out the 1690, the idea that 
Slavery, what a terrible stain on America. Right. It was, right. a, if you, it's a terrible, terrible institution. It's abysmal, awful, nefarious, but it's ubiquitous, all over the world, ubiquitous. Right. And it's what's really world. amazing about, about the West right. is the West had this unbelievable revelation that there's something wrong with slavery, that it's morally reprehensible. And who, were, and these were mostly Quakers, evangelicals, mostly British, right? Millennialists. But the different millennium. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Oh. Okay, so okay. let me distinguish right. two things here. On the one hand, first of all, the word millennium does not normally refer to a date. It normally refers to the thousand-year peri messianic period that will come when Jesus returns oh, oh, I see. in the okay. book of Revelation. Oh, okay. So a millennialist is a messianist. A millennialist is somebody who believes that the world currently is shot through with evil and oppression, and soon, well, that's apocalyptic, but, but at some point in the future, there will be a messianic era. Uh-huh. And so those are millennialists. Now, the, so you can be a Jew Quakers, or a Christian and be a millennialist. Oh, no? yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and a Muslim. And a Muslim, Muslim yeah. and a Buddhist. It's oh. really oh. almost a universal phenomenon. Huh. Um, the, um, the Quakers, every group that opposed slavery at the time of the writing of the Constitution in the 18th century, every group that opposed slavery was a millennial group in its origin. Huh. Okay. So, I, in a sense, we have integrated, ingested a millennial vision into the norms of our society. Hmm. And anti-slavery was a anti clearly a, is one of them. a millennial. The, yeah. Right. Before then, to be a master was a mark of honor, and to be a slave was a mark of disgrace. And we reverse that. To be a master is disgraceful. Right. And by the way, I, I, I you may know I don't. I don't think any of this, which is usually important to this issue, was in the so-called 1619 Project of the New York Times, which is now being taught in schools around America. Right. It's an amazing thing because as an old newspaper man, right, you're in the news business. Very hard to find news about 1619 because not a lot of people you can interview and not a lot of things you can see. What you could do is interview historians and say, oh, there's a trend among historians, mm -hmm. but of course, the New York Times didn't find that. They just invented this idea and pushed it, pushed it, pushed it out there. In fact, quite a few historians said, even those on right. the far left said, this is not, this is not accurate. Right. Right. All right. Um, you call yourself a, you, you, I mentioned you're a medievalist, but you call yourself a, a heretical yeah. medievalist. Right. What are some of your heresies? <laughs> well, um, First of all, I'm not politically correct in the, according to Y2K mind. Uh, but as a medievalist, I'm a heretic, among other things, because I think that apocalyptic belief, which I define as a sense of imminence, it's happening now. Mm. Um, and millennialism played a much greater role in the Middle Ages than traditional historians consider. So, for example, what I did was I started to – let me bring my, my father back into this. I grew up in a household where the question was, why the West? Why was the West able to literally generate a culture that certainly at the time I was growing up in the 50s and the 60s, most of the rest of the world, with the exception of Japan, couldn't even copy with the blueprints handed to them? So what's going on here? And of course, as you point out, my father's answer is culture, which is now politically incorrect. We could go into a discussion of the fate of that book and the fate of another book issued at the same time by the same press, namely Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, which argues the exact opposite. So you have the anthropologist arguing that culture has nothing to do with it. It's all the luck of where you happen to be and so on and so forth. Um, which sure doesn't express it doesn't explain Argentina, doesn't explain which is resource rich exactly. and poor. Yeah, okay. Exactly. It, it, it's it, it's a bad joke. It was hugely popular. It was yeah. as popular as another bad joke, namely Said's Orientalism. Edward Said's Orientalism, right. which took on Bernard Lewis, who right. we discussed right. and said, oh, right. Bernard Lewis, he has, even though he spoke 16 languages, he exactly. can't understand and, any culture but his own right. by definition. So, right. I, yeah, right, right, right. And Said, who barely spoke Arabic, 
uh, by the time he was and was not a historian up, and, and was not, not a historian, historian. and wasn't was trained in the field carried out a revolution a revolution that's in one of these that's one of the talks i'm giving it uh, asked me and as long as you say that i say what asked me is so people know the association for the study of middle east and africa which was founded by bernard lewis and Fuad ajami as a counter to the radical politicization of Middle Eastern studies by the Saidian epigones. Right. A point of uh, order or footnote, uh, Asmia was founded here at FDD by FDD and then spun off as a separate organ. Very nice. So I went into medieval history because I thought the cultural mutations that produced the modern West actually started as religious impulses and only later got secularized. Most historians start the modern period with 1500, the printing press, the Renaissance, and they like secularization. They like secular phenomena and they identify secular with modern. Mm -hmm. I think that modernity starts in the year 1000, that the 11th century is the first century we see this massive initiative and activity coming from below, um, which for me is the definition of what makes the modern West so unusual. In any case, in looking into it, I, you know, there was a whole, in the 19th century, the romantic historians like Michelet described the year thousand in very lurid colors. People thought it was going to be the end of the world. They were terrified then it passed, and with a sigh of belief, relief, they built the West. Mm. So that was, and that was rejected by in the late nineteenth century by more conservative historians, who I, I mean, Michelet openly connected his idea of this kind of expectation in the Middle Ages with the French Revolution. Who did? Michelet, okay, the French historian. Okay. So 1830, the revolution of 1830, to which he was witness and so on. So they were anti-revolutionary, anti-radical, and much more conservative. And they argued that nobody even knew what the year was. So I go into medieval history and I'm examining this. And I discover that, in fact, Christians have been dating and expecting the millennium to come at the end of the current millennium, which back at the origins of Christianity around the year 200 was defined as the year 500. Jesus was born in 5500 and he would return in 500 in the year 6,000, six days, a year is a day in the sight of a thousand years in the sight of the Lord. The sabbatical millennium will come in the year 500. Even before it didn't come, they redated to 800. In 800, we literally have historians counting down to the year 6,000. There are this many years left, all the years from Adam to the present, and then there. there. So we have this phenomenon, and then all of a sudden it disappears under the Carolingians who date Anno Domini. And when Charlemagne is crowned on the first day of the year 6,000, nobody writes about it. Nobody may, oh, they write about the coronation. They write about the date, Anno Domini. They don't write about the year 6000. So I'm saying, look, there's no way that Charlemagne wasn't affected by these ideas. And the conventional historian, like the historian who refused an article on this subject, said, I can't believe, I'll give you the English translation of their German, I can't believe that Charlemagne had anything whatsoever, irgendetwas, <laughs> to do with m millennialism or with eschatological mm, thinking. Mm. So in that sense, I'm a heretic even amongst medievalists. Okay, very good. Now, you also say that you're, this, this book you just written yeah. is much more judgmental than the normal prof professorial <laughs> historical affair. Yes. You said, although I claim to be a historian and to write reliable, accurate history books, and maybe you want to say a little bit about why you decided you were going to be more judgmental than you have been as a historian well, and professor. First, I'll confess that when I wrote that, the title of the book was They're So Smart Because We're So Stupid. <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> and then my daughters and my editor convinced me <laughs> that maybe insulting my readership wasn't good, even if I included myself in the stupidity, which I clearly don't. So um, although I identify with the people who have – done this stupidity. Um, yeah, I mean, in some senses, this book is just a, a cry from the deck of the Titanic. 
saying, you're headed straight for an iceberg. And my people around me, my colleagues at the time that I started to try and point this out, would say, you're imagining things. And, and, and the Titanic is Western civilization as a whole? Yeah. Okay, okay. And and the and the iceberg is, is a woke medieval, dogma or or a no. medieval millennial movement. Medieval, called, right? I call it the caliphators. It's the Muslims who, in this generation, believe that in this generation, in other words, they're apocalyptic. There will be a global caliphate established. I guess and that's, that's a millenni- millennial dream. Yeah, I was going to say exactly. the caliphate. To, to so, believe in the caliphate is right, millennial, right? Right. Yeah. So we are. We are being attacked by a medieval apocalyptic millennial movement of the most dangerous kind. In other words, what I call active cataclysmic, which means huge destruction has to happen in order for the millennium to come. And we are the active agents of that. So, for instance, Protestants who believe in the rapture think God's going to do the really nasty stuff. Now, right. there are branches that say, oh, you know, nuclear bombs is going to fulfill a nuclear war will fulfill Mm. the prophecy of john Mm. and therefore and the american nuclear warheads were armed in a town in texas because nobody wanted to arm them and they were willing to arm them because they believed that they were doing god's work really they had millennialists to arm the nuclear war (laughs) so but by and large most protestant uh, millennial apocalyptic thought millennial scenario is passive cataclysmic there will be a terrible tribulation but it will be brought about by god not by man whereas when you're active cataclysmic as for instance the taiping in china in the middle 19th century or the nazis there's no end to the amount of killing that you're willing to do for the sake of the redemption that you believe you're bringing. And the new world you're right. bringing. And so we're dealing with the, yeah. the most dangerous religious belief on the planet. And we insist on saying, absolutely not. It's Islamic, pho- it's Islamophobic to even talk about it. Right, right. And when you're talking about the caliphators, those who want to bring about the caliphate, you're talking, we, most people are going to think, rightly so, you're thinking of, ISIS, the Islamic State, you're right. thinking of Al-Qaeda, right. maybe Muslim Brotherhood. Yes. Um, these are all uh, Sunni, of course. Uh, I would argue, I think you'll agree with me, that the Shia regime, the radical Shia regime in, in Iran, Iran they're also caliphators. They wouldn't talk of a caliphate because they're Shia. They would talk of an imami because right. it's not a caliph, but an right. imam that's supposed to rule. But what you're saying, and this deserves a little attention, is that the regime that rules Iran, which is killing innocent Iranian women in particular, men, men, right now as we speak all over the country, people all over the country in Iran are rising up to say we are sick of the religious class being the ruling class. We're sick of an Islamist, jihadist ruler who don't care about us. These are people who, the, the, these rulers, not the people they're right. oppressing in Iran. Absolutely. I want to make it very clear because Absolutely. I'm very pro, pro, pro Iranian. Right. I'm pro anti regime. These people are what you describe. But what that also implies, this is very important, is they have a very different mentality, one that's hard for those of us in the West to understand. Absolutely. So when you are right. Barack Obama right. and you think, you know what? They want a little respect. Let's be nice to they them. They want me to outreach right. my if, hand, right. and they'll and then they'll unclench right. their fist. Right. And yes. if I give them money, surely yes. they'll want yes. to have the best darn healthcare system yes. in the Middle right. East right. and their schools. He doesn't understand, and he thinks I understand this because my father was a Muslim. Well, he was a secularized socialist African Muslim, which is not. He doesn't understand the first thing about the mentality, psychology, right. ideology. Right. You're describing. Do I have that right? <laughs> you do. And uh, in my book, I actually quote Obama saying 99.9% of Muslims around the world reject this medieval ideology. So a radical, radical misinformation. Yeah. He may have done it honestly in the sense, but I mean, it's well, kind let's of- Well, I mean, let's say it's not, let's say it's only 5%. We're talking about how many billion- Hundreds how, what, that, of millions. Hundreds of millions yeah. of people because you've got a very large yeah. Muslim. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a large yeah. percentage. Yeah. If it's 1%. It still can do quite a damage. It's five point nine. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And in terms of you know concentric circles of sort of committed to working for the caliphate 
mm. via mm-hmm. violence, it might be 1.1%, committed to working for the caliphate via cognitive warfare, what they call dawa, which is what uh, the late, and at least by me, not regretted uh, Yusuf al-Qaradawi uh, called the key to conquering the West. The West will be yeah. conquered by Dawa. That's a larger component, uh, certainly several percentage at least. And then in terms of people sympathetic to them, there's another circle or concentric circles of sympathy. And one of the things that those who study millennial movements were particularly attentive to the point at which they go public. In other words, there's lots of sort of low-level chatter about the millennium. You'll hear it all over the place. In Israel, you know, the Mashiach is coming. I remember one guy telling me about this wonderful celebrations for one holiday. And I said, oh, next year I'll come. He said, no, it's not going to happen. I said, when I said, because, you know, the Messiah is going. Anyway, so (laughs) you hear that, but that's low-level chatter. And it only becomes, goes public at certain propitious moments. And many times when it goes public, it gets driven from the public sphere. But at other times, it takes. And it takes when all of a sudden what seemed impossible looks like it might be possible. So in the year 2000, while you know Osama bin Laden had declared war on Americans, even people who might be sympathetic with the global caliphate, Muslims, thought that was crazy. And when he attacked America or at least if they had known that he was planning to attack America, they would have said, that's a catastrophe. That would be terrible. That's the worst thing you can possibly do. But once he succeeds, and once you get a whole bunch of Westerners who West explain what he did as, you know, the frustration of people being oppressed by the terrible hegemon, suffocating hegemon the United States, as did Baudrillard in France, once you get that, then all of a sudden people who would not be on sympathetic think, oh, and I think that one of the points I'm trying to make in my book is that systematically, although I think largely unawares, I don't think they're doing this on purpose, systematically Westerners, starting with Edward Said, whom I consider in his own way a Westerner, or certainly his followers were Westerners, have done things that have encouraged Muslims to become caliphators two points that occur to me. One is that the the regime in Iran, despite being caliphate, yes. despite being malign, uh, despite hating infidels, right. they're now closely aligned with Russia. They're supplying weapons to Russia in order to kill Ukrainians. Right. And Russia, of course, is formally aligned with communist China. Right. So in its essence, Islamic, Islamist Iran is formally aligned or with China. And other junior partners, in North Korea, which whatever, whatever, whatever crazy ideology that represents, and you know Marxist Leninist uh, or neo Marxist Leninist Venezuela and Cuba and Nicaragua, it's a very it's a very strange alliance. Of course, it's an alliance of convenience because what they all have in common is they want the death of America. They want the or the, at least the diminishment of America. They want. They want America take on the, it down, se- take it down pegs. several pegs. That's what they all together want. And that's important to understand as we think about why we're supporting the Ukrainians. And, and as people, and this is the current administration, Biden, Robert Malley, who's the chief negotiator, continue to say, can't we, can't we strike a deal yeah. with uh, this on, regime? Guys, please, will you stop we'll misbehaving give, in front of everybody? We'll, we want to make a deal with we'll you. We'll give you billions right, right. of dollars. All right. we want is a promise that we don't expect you to keep. And if you do, you'll still get nuclear weapons. Then we don't understand why the Saudis, for example, are angry at Biden and won't raise their oil prices just for a month so we can get through the midterm elections, please. And one of the, just, I'm coming back to your book because it's one of the things that this relates to what we're talking about. You open with a bunch of very pungent quotes, and one of them is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German Lutheran pastor, theologian, and anti-Nazi dissident, whom Hitler hanged just before the end of World War II. And that quote is, stupidity, we talk about stupidity is a more dangerous enemy of the good than malice. And I would say this is what we're talking about because I don't think Obama or Biden are, are, are malicious in reaching out to the Islamic Republic of Iran and those oppressors. I think in a certain sense, I'm sorry to say, 
that's they're ignorant. They're ignorant about another psychology and about, they're ignorant about they don't believe in an ideology because they don't quite have one. They really are ignorant about the people and people in the State Department and people in the intelligence community. I think most of them don't also they don't have the imagination to understand people who are fundamentally different right. from them. Am I yes? Absolutely. I mean, I have a chapter um, on liberal cognitive egocentrism. Yeah. And egocentrism is an interesting term because it was uh, coined by a psychiatrist who had teenage boys as his specialty. And he realized that they can think of nothing but sex and assume <laughs> that everybody else can think of nothing but sex. Uh -huh. So he, and there are exceptions. You've, you, you've, you've done some research on this. I'm sorry, Danielle, but uh, Danielle likes my jokes. It's okay. <laughs> no, but does our audience? Anyway. Does our audience? I well, I could be, you know, can right. they cancel me? You know, in that's what case, I say. Can they cancel in me? Any case. So he coined this term cognitive egocentrism, which is projecting your mentality. Yeah. And what liberals do is they project their mentality. I, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a student, well, and, a and the dogma of Y2K is you must project that mentality. You are not allowed to suspect the other of having a mentality which by our values would be much below us. Well, so, but, okay. it, or just, can it, but it doesn't, it could be just different. No, I it could different. be just different. I mean, I agree case, with that. Look, I mean, case, yeah, but in this Genghis case, Khan didn't conquer all, all the lands he conquered because he had legitimate grievances. He wanted to be a conqueror. Right. And in fact, in most of history, and you as you know, people wanted to conquer, and that was the honorable and... Ruler be ruled. Yeah, that was the, that was the choice. And one was great right. and one was terrible, right? right? If you were not right. going to be an empire... But democracy is built on giving that up. Ooh, and we, that's dangerous. Yes. Well, it's it's enormously productive. It is the cultural change. I mean, one of the interesting things that I haven't been able to track it down yet, but allegedly, Keynes said, capitalism is the first system whereby you can be a man without killing a man. Hmm. Now, hmm. actually, I'd argue Judaism is the first hmm. cultural system hmm. in which not only can you be a man without killing another man, you should, men shouldn't be killing other men. Mm, okay, mm -hmm. So, um, mm. but but what you've got is, the, Eli Sagan wrote a wonderful book about this called um, The Honey and the Hemlock, and he calls it the paranoid imperative, mm. which is, I have to rule over you because if I don't, you'll rule over me. I have no choice. Right. It's a defensive mood. Right, right, right. All right. And he says that overcoming that uh, mentality it is so difficult, given what he calls human psychological disabilities, that it's virtually a miracle that there ever was a democracy. And I'm arguing it took a thousand years to build that up. It's a hugely difficult process to give up this kind of, uh, I call it limbic captivity to honor shame, you know, you, you insult me and I have to draw blood. And another implication of that that just occurs to me here is, okay, this idea, I have to, what did you say, I have to conquer you or be right. conquered, that's it, right? That's it. So at the end of World War II, what does the United States say? No, we're going to have a new model. We're going to have an international liberal rules-based order. We'll have a UN. We're not going to be. Right. We're not going to occupy Germany and France. And we're not going to rule you. Oh, right. We're going to all meet together and we're going to settle on rules and the rules will apply mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. And it won't be conquer or be conquered. We'll all live together. And what's going on right now in it's the, the world. It's the unraveling. Of it's not just the unraveling. It is that. But it's also China in particular. And Putin totally agrees with this. It's very right. clear in his view. We think this liberal world order that you've established is oppressive to us, and we're either going to destroy it or take it over. There's no other possibility. We're not going to reform it. We're not going to, you know, marginal. We're not going to chew on the edges and margin. We're no, not going to play in this. We're not going to play in this right. game. We don't agree with you. This right. has worked. You don't want to conquer us, fine, but we want to conquer and rule you. And so you right now right. have Chinese, what they call wolf warriors, yelling and 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 attacking. I think um, member staffers of Congress for for because you you don't understand. We make the rules, including for you. And you have people in American corporations saying, you know what? We have to be sensitive of their rules, and they can have they can and they're telling the Uyghurs, you're going to learn to be good 
junior Han Chinese and stop being Turks and stop being Muslims. And by the way, does that bother the, the mullahs in Tehran? No. Does it bother any of the leaders in all the many countries of the Muslim world? Not that I can see pretty much like that. There so that's what's going on. Huh? Not, there are some, but there are some many. exceptions. You're but right, not but many. not a lot right. and not very. No. And, and what I point out is that this attitude towards China is something that already happened in what the West was trained to have an attitude towards Islam and the Palestinians. Mm. In other words, we put up with an enormous amount and say, oh, well, we have to understand it. And of course, the, the radicals west explain it as, you know, they're fighting oppression and so on. Every time you see somebody explain to you, a Westerner explain to you what jihad is about, he's just projecting yeah. his, yeah. you know, sort of revolutionary values onto these people. These people are into dominion. They're not into... Uh, uh, resistance. Um, so yes. And actually I'd like to get back to what you were saying about Iran, because the fact that the Iranian leadership is embedded in a millennial ideology means that literally, and specifically to the caliphator imamate, uh, imam, imamator, um, uh, 21st century zeitgeist, um, these people believe that suicide is a way to bring about the destruction. Um, you can't deal with nuclear weapons according to the doctrine of mad with people for whom they're perfectly willing to sacrifice their own people. They don't, they don't have a commitment to their own people. They have a commitment to their ideology and they believe that ultimately it will be for the redemption of mankind. And Khomeini was very clear about that in a number of his, quote, his quotes, which people like Bernard Lewis recognize. Almost none of the reporters in Iran in 1979, I was among them, understood. For example, when he was asked what he felt about being back in Iran after exile, right. he said, I feel nothing. What did that mean? It meant yeah, he didn't Iran care about the country. Right. Uh, he also said that, you know, um, patriotism is paganism. What does that mean? It means if you love your country, you don't love Islam and Sharia with all things you should love. When he was asked, and and he also said, if if Iran must burn, let it burn for the triumph, the conquest of Islam in the world. This is very important. And to understand. These are his inheritors today, and yeah. so let's go back to the 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 stupidity of the West in ignoring this stuff. I, yeah, 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 You know, yeah, yeah. at one point I began to feel that, you know, people would say, well, they're naive. And I would say, you know, it's it's a very aggressive form of naivete. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to work hard not to understand that you're being had. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's another dimension in this, and I have another chapter in the book dedicated to what I call preemptive dimitude, mm -hmm. which is the idea that, the way to deal with aggressive jihadi caliphators, the way to deal with aggressive caliphators, who are only too happy to say, if you're not nice to me, I got buddies who can be a lot nastier. Um, the way to deal with them is to essentially adopt a whole series of traits that are appropriate to vimis. Uh, and the Vimy is the minority in the Muslim world. So the Jews and the Christians initially, people of the book, it's presented by the apologists as a protected population. But what are they protected from? They're protected from Muslim violence by their subservience. Right. They have to right? pay a special as tax long as they don't and, and recognize their own. Criticize, insult, demean Muslims. And they have to accept their inferiority right. that they and their humiliation publicly, accept, publicly right. in all sorts of ways. Right. So what they do is, and, and the key thing, of course, is not to criticize Muslims. And the second key thing is, as leaders of their Dhimmi community, they have to make sure that the community doesn't upset the Muslims. And so you get this form of a kind of cultural AIDS, autoimmune deficiency, in which these proleptic or preemptive Dhimmi um, in the leadership attack not the invaders of the body politic, but the white blood cells that are gathering to fight it off. And so you get the attack on the Islamophobes. I'm sure you've almost certainly have been accused of Islamophobia and so on and so forth. So 
all that discourse about Islamophobia, racism, and so on and so forth is essentially the 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 language that's used by Western preemptive dhimmi who are would much rather attack their own right wing, as they call it in quotes, uh, would much rather attack their own right wing than than deal with aggressive Muslims, whom they'll deny are aggressive. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about this, because you, you deal with anti-Semitism in various ways in this book. Right. Um, and we have a couple of ways that where people are, I think, are thinking about it now. I mean, you've got, you know, Kanye West, right, who's, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm going to go DEFCON 3. That doesn't mean what he thinks it means, right? right? It, it, it <laughs> it's means a defense. Like, it's, it's, no, it okay. means a state of alert and awareness. And, it okay. just sounded we know good. What he, we, you know, we, we know what he means. Right. right. Um, you also have the the UN Human Rights Council, which at the which focuses predominantly the whole NGO world, the whole NGO world, right. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all anti-Israel, and now this Commission of Inquiry at the UN that the UN, UN Human Rights Council set up, which is to is funded and staffed in perpetuity to uh, delegitimize, demonize Israel as the, the, the uh, you know compared to any nation in the world. This is the worst, even right, though right. if you go to Ramallah and have a dinner and a right. beer, it's pretty. It's not a bad place in the Middle East right, standards, right? right it's right. not, bad. This, this is, you know, you think you're in Amman or someplace like that. But that's what they're doing. And this, I mean, talk about how how this relates. Right. That the, so, is this dimmy to that the UN decides, okay, right. of all the things right. going on in the world. But I mean, part of it is this one little country that has a Jewish majority in all the world. There's one Jewish community in the Middle East. It's easy to focus on that. It's hard to focus on China. It's hard to focus on Russia. They're both on the Security Council as part of this new idea we had of no, uh, we don't rule you, you don't rule us, right. we don't conquer you, you don't conquer us. Right. They're utilizing the UN for right. their purposes in a way we don't know how, essentially. Right. Or don't, why don't we? Yeah. Right. Uh, so look, uh, the, the book, the, the seed crystal that makes for Y2K mine, which is the sort of the Western face of pro, pro, preemptive dimitude. The seed crystal that makes for it is the case of Muhammad Adoura, this 12-year-old boy mm -hmm. whom France to Charles Andelin, a French Jew who made Aliyah to uh, Israel, who served in the IDF, who was in the spokesman's unit at the IDF and a journalist, publishes this footage saying the Israelis, this, 2000, September 30th, 2000, yeah. right? Um, and he publishes it saying the Israelis deliberately targeted this father and son, killed the boy in his father's arms, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the journalist, the Palestinian cameraman who took it under, on, you know, wrote out an affidavit the next day saying it was in cold blood, he knows, et cetera. Now, I think it's fake, but it doesn't even matter. I mean, it matters that it's a fake, but even if you don't want to accept that it was staged, the fact is that footage of a boy who is shot in a crossfire between Israeli and Palestinian troops, and we have footage of Palestinians shooting from behind the father and the son at the Israelis, you know, that all of a sudden in the European mind becomes a picture in the words of Catherine Ney, a French, uh, very important French journalist to this day, uh, said this picture erases, replaces the picture of the boy in the Warsaw ghetto. Mm. Mm. So at that moment, you have what I would call both radical, imperial, and moral disorientation. If you think that a picture of a boy caught in a crossfire, even if he, the Israelis had some soldier had deliberately killed them. If you think that that erases and replaces a picture right. of that symbolizes the deliberate tracking down and murder of a million right. Jewish children, you know, what planet are you on? Well, you're on planet Y2K mind right, because right, now right. all of a sudden all the words reverse. This is Holocaust inversion. Now the Israelis are the ones who are the Nazis, the Palestinians are the ones who were the Jews. Palestinians who admire Hitler, who want to finish his job, who openly say it in Arabic, become the Jews of the 21st century, and the Israelis who do as much as they possibly can not to kill Palestinian civilians despite more being attacked more world. than any military in the world, right, the world. are accused of genocide. 
And I think that that moment of inversion, which is I call anti Semitism in the form of anti Zionism, the, the soft underbelly of the West through which the jihadis invade, the caliphaters invade, um, that moment becomes a turning point in the use of language. All of a sudden, genocide doesn't mean what it meant. Oh, it, now all of a sudden, 9 11, before, during the Oslo peace process, journalists didn't want to use the word terrorist to describe Hamas attacks. On civilians, which is, you know, you can't get, okay, deliberate attacks targeting civilians. And they wouldn't call it terrorism. The Israelis were saying, this is no fair. And they were saying, oh, well, sorry, we're infuriating you, but, you know, we're just doing our job. 9-11, the BBC and Reuters, both British, did that to the United States. And they sent out memos saying, you are not to refer to what happened as a terrorist attack. You can quote people saying it's a terrorist attack, but we're not going to call it a terrorist attack. And then all of a sudden, you know, and then the field of um, (laughs) peace and conflict studies adopts the same idea, which is we can't call this terrorism. You know, and the definition of terrorism is actually not judgmental. It's very, it's just very clear. It's violence directed specifically against civilians for political purposes. Well, but it is judgmental because we don't think that should be, people should behave that way. Well, um, yeah. some of us don't. Right, yeah. and certainly, I mean, look, it turns out the Palestinians don't like being called terrorists because they realize that that's not good for their image. So they threaten the terrorists, threaten the journalists not to call them terrorists. Right. And the journalists then turn to the West and say, well, we're just being neutral because we don't want to use emotional words. Right. So, I mean, I track this out in my my book. I have a chapter on 9-11, yeah. and there's a whole section on this, this di- discussion. And, and the, the basic dishonesty, uh, I, I mean, it's hard to imagine what they're thinking when they do things like, I think it was Dean Baquet saying— Who was the uh, editor of the New York right, Times, right? Editor of the New York Times saying, look, you know, we're— we're doing this because we're concerned for the safety of our journalists and for ethical reasons. No, you're doing this unethically because you're afraid. And right. yet, and right. yet they say these things and the public has very little problem with it. And the people who do have problems with it then get pushed further and further to the right and out of the discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, speaking as somebody who spent a lot of years in full-time journalism, when it's not, this is odd cycle, when you're intimidated, you don't want to admit you're intimidated. Absolutely. So psychologically, what do you do? You right. begin to say, well, they have a point, don't right. they? Right. I mean, maybe it is too emotional to mention that there are people in Gaza in the streets firing rockets at Israelis indiscriminately. I, right. I know they don't want me to mention that, Maybe, but maybe they're right that I should and I don't need to tell my readers that. I'm right, not, right. Maybe I tell my right. editors, maybe I don't. Right. And it's it's kind of, it's corrupting in a very yes, deeply. Way. And and I argue, I mean, I have a chapter called Lethal Journalism. Yeah, right, right, right. And that's right. What, what started in with the story of Muhammad Adua. This yeah. was a lethal narrative that was meant to arouse hatred of the Israelis and to justify the Palestinian desire for revenge. And this, they... The the journalists essentially channeled Palestinian lethal narratives, which which were war propaganda, as news to their readers in the West. And the peak moment for this is Jenin. Right. Where, you know, the Palestinians are saying they're lining people up and anybody who had read uh, uh, Goldhagen about the way the Polish, uh, the, the German division and Browning on the, you know, the German police uh, division that rounded up Jews and shot them at the beginning of the Holocaust in 41 would recognize the description of Israelis, you know, digging ditches, lining civilians up and shooting that's them what, in. That's what they were saying. That's what the Palestinians were claiming. It. And the journalists who had not been there reported all of this right. as credi- credible. Right. Right. And so there's this massive wave of demonstrations against Israel in which people literally wore suicide vests, mock suicide vests, mm-hmm. to show their solidarity with the people who were targeting them. 
And what do we actually know did happen in Janine? Why don't you need to explain Oh, that? yeah. So it turns out that after three weeks of hand-to-hand combat in really terrible circumstances, there were 52 Palestinians killed, of whom 40 were combatants. So it's a ratio of like three militants to one civilian in urban warfare. That's unheard of. Nobody, normally it's one militant to three civilians. And here it's literally reversed. And yet, to this day, people will refer to the Janine Massacre. Well, and they may again, because as you know, right now in Janine and other parts of the yes, North and West right, Bank, right. we have these various groups. Right. Uh, Joe Trusman of FDD has been reporting on it rather well, like the Lions Den, right. who have been who since March have been carrying out terrorist attacks on Israelis, including in in Tel Aviv and right. Jerusalem and you know, all, you know, in various places. And the Israelis have kind of waited think, to the, for the Palestinian Authority to exert control. Yeah. It hasn't happened. Right. I'm not sure we know whether that's because the Palestinian Authority doesn't want to or can't. Or doesn't Probably want to a or combination can't. of both. Maybe some combination <laughs> of both. <laughs> it it's, doesn't it's, want to right. take the effort. And so the Israelis right. are saying, well, we have right. to right. Right. boot out. And, but, that, but there's a lot of fighting right. going on. People are being killed. There was right. another reporter for Al Jazeera who right. got killed again yes. in, a, in a crossfire and, as far as we know. And then again, it was the same thing. Oh, look what the Israelis are doing. As, They're soon, as, as soon as the Palestinians said, we saw where the bullets came from, which is exactly what yeah. exactly what Talal Abu Rahman, the yeah. Aldura affair said. I knew where the bullets were coming from. Charles Landelin took his word and said, firing from the Israeli position. Turns out the bullets weren't coming from the Israeli position. Yeah, with the Al Jazeera report, they may have been the Israelis. They could have been us. But, but we immediately yeah. people picked yeah, up course, the yeah. accusation. And right, so right, even right, if right. you said... The Israelis killed her, but not on purpose. Right. Forget it. As soon as you say the Israelis killed her, it's on purpose. And a lot of people, right. yeah, a lot and of that's the, it must be on That's purpose. the sort of instinct. Yeah. And, and one of the things that this points out is Janine, at the time the Israelis went in in 2002, after a year and a half of suicide bombings that were really terrible, over a thousand civilians, men, women, and children targeted um were killed, they go into Janine. Janine was the suicide cap, suicide martyr capital of Palestine. That's how the Palestinians talked about it. There were posters honoring and worshiping these suicide uh, martyrs and so on and so forth everywhere. The, the, and it was a refugee camp. It wasn't even the city. And, and uh, you know, and nobody knew this. People thought, I mean, I remember the Boston Globe literally talked about how most of the city had been destroyed, whereas none of the city was touched. So those lethal narratives, and what I'm arguing is, look, there may be some journalists, and there certainly is, unfortunately, an audience which seems to have an insatiable appetite for news about Jews behaving badly. (laughs) But, you know, journalists, normally we expect to have a little more um, sense of profession. Um, So let's say as many as 20% of the journalists who report Palestinian stuff because it gives them a sense of whatever. I would say it's a supersessionist drive, but that's another subject. Um, Report this stuff because it makes them feel good. The other 80% are doing it because they've been directly intimidated Mm -hmm. and they don't want to talk about it. This is a big book, and we're not going to be able to talk about everything in it, but I'm going to give you a chance. Is there one other point that you make in the book that you want to make sure you bring up before we conclude this conversation? We came close to this a number of times in the conversation, and that is the issue of woke and and so on. And again, a lot of the elements that are part of the woke mindset we're already building up in the, yeah. you know, literally since the 60s, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. if you will, sort of after World War I, Marshall Plan, UN, et cetera, positive some rules for II. the world community, World War II, positive some rules for the world community. It, 60s is a millennial wave of, you know, I dreamed I saw the bomber jet planes turning into butterflies across our nation. Woodstock generation and stuff, which I was a part of, and which, if you know, it's a great feeling when you think that, you know, if you just try hard enough, you can change the world. 
In a positive direction. In a positive <laughs> way, right. Yeah. Uh, 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 an evolutionary leap, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, and then that the, the sort of failed radicals go into – um, some of them go into the academy and they develop these millennial ideologies, mm. uh, critical theory, et cetera, et cetera, postmodernism and so on. And they're working in their own way to sort of undermine the Western canon and the Western, you know, objectivist ideology and so on. Um, so a lot of these ideas about critical race theory and stuff predate. But I really think that the success that the Palestinians had in driving a wave of fake news across the legacy media spectrum, even Fox, you know, I mean, Fox editorial is one thing, but Fox news reporters, they know the rules in the Middle East. They know that they are what they can say and what they can't say and so on. So, um, the fact that you have this massive success of a media playing a role, and as you say, you know, using sort of their ideological commitment as a cover for their intimidation, which they certainly can't admit to their readers, but don't even want to admit it to themselves. You know, they use this, this discourse as a way of hiding uh, their cowardice and their success in doing that, I think, made it possible for a whole series of other radical devaluation of language, like racism. You know, I think racism is used today in the most absurd ways. I also think anti-Semitism is used today. You know, it's, I don't think, I'm a medievalist, I know what real anti-Semitism is. And so if somebody's prejudiced, against Jews, if somebody doesn't like Jews, I wouldn't call that anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism for me is when it's either we exterminate the Jews or they will rule over us, right, right? Right, which is right, the Nazi right, fantasy. Right. And it, it's also the, the caliphater fantasy. And the, dry, and, the dry, and the Dreyfus thing, it was some, there was some of that, right? Yeah, the, the League of Anti-Semitism was, you know, these Jews are taking over. Our and we must, we must wipe them out. So, them. so, and certainly racism, you know, prejudice, there's a difference between prejudice and racism. And right, so if right. you're prejudiced, that doesn't yeah, mean you're yeah, a racist. Right. And yet it's used yeah. as a kind of cognitive war weapon yeah. to go after people. And actually, this isn't in the book, but it's something that I'm thinking about, and it's relevant to to what's happening now, which is that you have a press that has become um, activated. Um, so, for example, the recent case, the guy's name escapes me, but in Pennsylvania, the, the guy who had the stroke. Fetterman. Fetterman. Okay, so you literally have the press refusing to acknowledge something that it's their job to inform the public right, about right, right. going after the one journalist who broke ranks mm, right 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 that's a press that is literally trying to force people to take decisions it's propaganda it's definition of propaganda you tell people things that will make them decide mm. things that if they knew better they wouldn't want to do Mm. Um, and mm, so, mm, and, and I mm. think that starts, I, I think a lot of the reporters back then and still, you know, they think that by emphasizing Palestinian suffering, by showing pictures of poor Palestinians coming into hospitals, often staged stuff, but okay, there are people who are killed and there are people who suffer. Focusing on that is a way to bring about, to stop the violence by forcing, by outraging world opinion and forcing Israel to back off, okay? And I think that that's, that's the sort of mental process of a lot of journalists, particularly once the conflict breaks out. That's what they do whenever it breaks out, as it does every two or four years. Um, and, and the response of the West is insane. So you have literally now to come back to ASMIA and, and Middle East Studies Association, you have a Middle East Studies Association, which represents the vast majority of specialists in the Middle East, in American academia, formally abandoning 
It's principles of impartiality. That's not ASMIA. That's Mesa, that's the Mesa, Middle, East Studies Association. Middle East Studies Association, which was taken over by Said, um, literally adopting a coercive uh, movement, BDS, Boycott, BDS, Divestment, yeah. and Sanctions Against Israel, Israel, and therefore formally siding with people who celebrated 9-11. And whom the press was intimidated into not reporting celebrated 9-11. So that, I think, is a really good illustration of the kind of moral and empirical disorientation with which we're afflicted and which I think literally is destroying democracy from within. I happen to have faith because I think this is a thousand-year a movement that took a millennium and it's got a lot of of power to it, but right now our trajectory is very negative. Well, our guest has been Richard Landis. He's the author most recently of a book you should buy and read, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? Lethal Journalism, Anti-Semitism, and Global Jihad. Thanks so much for dropping in today and having this very interesting <laughs> conversation. Lots to think about. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who have been with us for this conversation here today on Foreign Policy. Thank you for listening to Foreign Policy. If you found the program worthwhile, we suggest you subscribe to Foreign Policy on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you prefer to listen to your podcasts. Send us your feedback, your questions, your ideas to foreignpolicy at fdd.org. For more information about this episode and others and about our distinguished guests, visit us online at fdd.org. Until next time, I'm Cliff May, and you've been listening to Foreign Policy.